Good evening. This is the first occasion where an audience has abided by the quality of light and actually come together in silence to, to start an event. And certainly it has something to do with our invited speaker tonight. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nader Tehrani, and as the Dean of the Erwin S. Channon School of Architecture, I'm honored to introduce tonight's guest speaker, renowned engineer, Robert Silman. The lecture is a special occasion and is made possible by the generous contributions of the Steele Institute of New York, whose continued support has sponsored interdisciplinary events like this that bring the School of Engineering close to the School of Architecture. In particular, I'd like to express my profound gratitude to Gary Higby, whose leadership at the Steele Institute has been transformative and central to this collaboration for over five years. Thank you, Gary. I first met Robert Silman about a decade ago when I inherited a, pres a, a present from the then chair Harvard grad of the Harvard Graduate School of Design, Toshiko Mori, who happens to be a distinguished alumna of this school. Having stepped into the leadership position, Toshiko asked me to take on a course featuring critical collaborations between engineers and architects with the aim of demonstrating the disciplinary agency of certain architectural inventions that are the result of integrated ideas. Bringing engineering to the fore, Silman and a host of other engineers helped, to help the young architects at the GSD gain a sense of the speculative world in which they were about to step. This was less about the type of calcified consultancy that one imagines in practice, but rather the instrumental role of innovations that are part and parcel of the engineering mind, especially when their architectural implications become the defining features of certain projects. Robert Silman is the present emeritus of the structural engineering firm he founded in 1966. Since then, he's played a central role in all aspects of the firm, from design to administration, and he's overseen a range of projects from ground-up construction to the more delicate and dangerous restructuring of landmark buildings that require a fine-tuned attention due to the complexities of their sites, their building systems and organizations, many of which would be led to obsolescence were they not brought to renovation and alteration. In those instances, Silman's work is closer to forensics and surgery than that of the mere calculation of beams. The combination of his investigative mind and nimble fingers are what make for interventions that initially seem barely plausible into extraordinary cultural feats. Robert Silman received his Bachelor of Arts at Cornell University in 1956. He then went on to New York University where he graduated cum laude in 1960 with a Bachelor of Civil, Civil Engineering. And subsequently, he continued at NYU to receive a Master's of Civil Engineering in 1963. He's had a long and illustrious career gaining recognition with a wide range of awards, too many to enumerate here, but some of the most recent are a testament to his presence in the field. In November 2015, Mr. Silman received the Louise Dupont Crown and Shield Award from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Recognizing decades of commitment to the preservation of historic landmarks, the Crown and Shield Award is the National Trust for His Historic Preservation's highest national recognition. In October of 2013, Silman also received the Association for Preservation Technology International's Harley J. McKee, McKee Award in recognition of his outstanding contributions to the field of preservation technology. Now, Silman's lecture tonight, I thought was being called being heroic, but in fact, it's being heroic. And yet, as I understand it, he will argue conversely that beyond the acts of heroism, that is associated with the monumental acts of engineering, there's the question of judgment, context, the presence of history, 
and the intelligence that the discipline brings to culture as, a as part of a larger conversation with the evolution of the city. In short, an appeal to engineering as an intellectual act. Silman has taught at a range of schools, and despite threats of retirement, he continues to practice in Boston, where he also teaches at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Before I welcome him to the stage, I'm also bound by certain duties, which I believe turn out not to be on the immediate slides after this, but they have to do with the AIA credits. Certificates of completion will be mailed to both AIA members and non-AIA members who, indic who indicate their request for one on the attendance sheet and provide their email address if you could make sure to do so. So without delay, please help me in welcoming Robert Zillman to the stage. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Nada. Um, he's read things into this presentation, uh, which I didn't even know were there. <laughs> he hasn't seen it yet. Uh, before I begin, there are several housekeeping things to do in terms of the AIA. First, our thanks to the Steel Institute and the Ornamental Metals Institute of New York uh, for providing the sponsorship for this lecture. It's got an official course number, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the AIA offers learning units and there is a sign up uh, desk I believe outside that you can get credit for and even if you're not AA if you want to get a certificate I think you can do that um, you can read this quickly you get one and a half units uh, for, for that um, the course description is something that is mandatory by AIA credits um, and you can read that and I will tell you about what being uh, heroic as we raise our voice means uh, and more than that this is always required you need to have four learning objectives if you want to get credits so uh, these are the objectives I will recite these uh, I hope you'll appreciate why every project need not be heroic to yield important insights into design Two, you'll understand how working on historic buildings often provides valuable insights into designing new steel frame buildings three Conversely, understand why designing new steel structures often provides insights useful in working on older steel buildings. And four, uh, increase their knowledge, your knowledge, this is of 21st century technologies applicable to structural steel used in building design, both available now and on the wish list of uh, mine. So, being heroic. Um, When we present our work, most people like to show the most eye-catching and dazzling projects that we've done. This is sort of uh, in our genes. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, I'm going to do some of that tonight. Why not? It makes for good viewing and, and good listening and good stories. But I thought I would depart from the more standard form of this type of a talk, what I call being heroic without the question mark. Um, and show some other kinds of things. Um, I want to talk also uh, about what is in reality the great majority of most professional practices. Buildings that are not necessarily so heroic, not so glamorous. Um, it is the more everyday part of our work, the, the stuff that doesn't make the magazines but keeps the firm going. The jobs that inform and instruct our staff prepare them for the challenges of the more difficult projects. These are vital to our survival and our growth. Um, I'm reminded of a remark that was made many, many years ago to me by a, a mechanical engineering colleague when he said, for every job that's been published in a magazine, I can show you in our books a financial loss. Our firm is now pretty large. Uh, we have some 170 people in three offices in New York, Boston, and, and Washington. Uh, we've done more than 21,000 projects. It's a staggering number. 
In fact, one of our largest problems is keeping track of things, the filing systems, uh, even the electronic ones. But we have a warehouse full of old paper files still going. So that's a lot. Um, but if one does three or four or five jobs a year that could be considered heroic or monumental, maybe for our firm that amounts to 250 over our 51 years of practice. What about the other 20,750 projects? You know, where do they stand? Where do they rank? So tonight you're going to see some of both, the heroic and the non-heroic. I'm not sure the ratio is going to be 250 to 20,000 um, because the 250 make for better looking. Uh, but on the other hand, I do want to spend some time on those. Um, I know this talk is sponsored by the Steele Institute, and I'll get to Steele in a minute. Uh, but let me begin by saying that I started my practice very, very modestly some 51 years ago. I was a single practitioner with virtually no clients and virtually no work. But I had a couple of things on my side. I was young and I was patient. Uh, I was willing to build a practice from the ground up and I took very seriously every single job that came into our office. Many, if not most, of uh, our early project used steel in its simplest form. A lot of our original clients were one-person architects who took any job they could get to put bread on the table. A fee of a few thousand dollars in the 1960s went a long way. They were not they were not too proud to design a one-story building with concrete block walls, simple open web joists for an industrial use, concrete slab on grade. I remember doing such a building once in my first year of practice for a man who couldn't speak English. He was a baker and he had saved up money. He bought a piece of land and commissioned this local architect to build the building, it was just, looked just like this, a little box of a building. And he was out there the day of the, quote, topping out ceremony, when the bar joists were put on the roof and spread out. And tears came to his eyes, and he actually hugged me. I never forgot that. <clears throat> Not to get too maudlin. Um, <clears throat> One of our, or, or should I say my, because I was still, still in the singular, I'm still talking about the years when I was a single practitioner, the first and second year. Um, one of the first jobs I had uh, of any consequence that had repeated business in it was to design some movie theaters. Uh, ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, thought it in, in their wisdom to build theaters and distribute films, and they picked small Midwestern cities and I worked for an architect named Henry George Green, uh, an older man who got this job. He had a connection with ABC, and we cranked these theaters out. I must have done 10 or 12 of them. Um, simple, again, bar joist roof, truss girders, steel columns, spandrel beams that were steel or sometimes masonry. Um, God knows how they stood up against wind. I guess we did something there, but um, <laughs> we did crank them out. Uh, and it was a great beginning for me in terms of getting repeated work. What's the point here? Uh, I have to admit that on every single one of these projects, I learned something. It may have been a small detail. It may have been a spec item. It may have been a field condition. But this helped me to justify my taking this sort of work. I, you know, at that age, I had an enormous amount to learn. I think I had a lot of nerve at age 30 going out on my own, because I had only worked for big firms. And when I got into this little work, it was very different. Um, but as I say, it was a learning experience. It was a tremendous training ground. And to this day, our firm still takes work like this because it is such a good training ground for our young engineers. The work goes in and the work goes out. It happens quickly. And on every project, there is something to be learned. A few years into the practice, an architect with whom I worked uh, in the city of Yonkers, a, a man named Joe Roth, got a contract from the city of Yonkers to do a picnic shelter in a city park called Cook Field. He was a wonderfully, wonderfully creative architect. He had worked at Skidmore Owings in Merrill. And he said to me, let's not do one of those conventional 70-foot clear span 
laminated wood picnic shelters that you see in all these local parks. That's no fun, he said. So together we came up with a, like a munchkin-like solution of some 20 overlapping steel mushrooms made from weathering steel. First, how do we arrive at this form? Well, we realized that bending steel plates and, and welding them into a curved shape would be prohibitively expensive for an ordinary structural steel fabricating shop that was geared to deal with straight beams and, and punching them for uh, bolted connections or welded connections. Um, we came up with a solution that today might be called um, thinking out of the box. I never liked this expression, um, for it implies that our everyday thinking is somehow within some sort of a box. I, I, I don't think that's true. I would prefer to believe that we're always thinking outside the box, always applying um, to each problem our best creative effort, our best cerebral uh, power. Why should it be only the heroic structures that get our best input? So who bends steel plate and welds it every day as part of their standard operations? That's what we said to ourselves. Boiler makers. Huh. We went to the local boiler shop in Yonkers, and when we timidly asked them if they had the skills to bend the plates and weld them into something that looked like this, we showed them a sketch, they laughed. Uh, and they said, this is easy. And they took us out to the floor, and they showed us some of the complicated curved plate structures that they were making. Uh, when I ventured to ask if their welders could meet the structural building code for welding, again they laughed, and they said, just think of the criteria that we have to do when we weld boilers compared to when you weld steel plates for building. It's much more critical. So they got the contract for this. And once we had the cutting pattern, these are hexagonal. Once we had the cutting pattern for one-sixth of one of these, we just duplicated it 120 times. They curved it, and they welded it, and it was really cheap. It came in less expensive than the conventional wood laminated plate. I'm sorry, wood laminated picnic shelter, these plates. And we had our picnic area. Um, our decision to use weathering steel uh, was an obvious choice for maintenance reasons. You know, the first architectural, this was 19... 71, I think. The first architectural use of weathering steel had been about five years earlier. Saarinen had used it in the John Deere building in Moline, Illinois. Um, at the time, not only did U.S. Steel make their product called Corten, but Bethlehem had an equal uh, product called Mayari R. And in fact, it was Mayari R that was used on this project. They were the same chemical content. Um, not a lot was yet understood about the problems uh, that might ensue from the use of weathering steel in these earlier applications. You know the principle. The steel uh, rusts until it gets a patina on the outside. It forms a good hard coating and no more rust takes place because that is, acts like a barrier uh, against the weathering uh, elements that would tend to rust steel. But how could one guarantee that the initial corrosion was fairly uniform in an architectural structure and that all parts of the structure would stop rusting at the same time? Uh, Cook Field, the skyward facing surfaces, obviously got the brunt of the rain, while the inside or the ceiling part of the structure uh, got much less. Sometimes the inside surfaces showed streaking from rainwater rivulets that ran down from the edge. But after a couple of years, the patina did form and the rusting stopped. There was some staining of adjacent collateral material that the runoff water, as the runoff water carried particles, but we did put gravel around the base of these, and of course that prevented any real staining in terms of it being unsightly because you could always rake the gravel up. This project won an AISC award in 1972, that's the American Institute of Steel Construction, uh, as one of the best steel structures of the year. The award ceremony was scheduled to take place um, and it was held at the site. The mayor was there, the city manager was there, the architect, the engineer, the people from AISC were there. Um, and unfortunately that day was an awful day. It was blowing rain. And I think it was in March like this. 
did we get wet? Maybe these picnic shelters were interesting, uh, but they didn't provide the same degree of shelter as the big one-piece, 70-foot laminated wood. So much for thinking out of the box. Uh, to my point of, though, of every structure not being necessarily heroic, but of still having merit, here's another building by the same architect, by Joe Roth. It's in Yonkers. It's right on the New York Thruway. If you drive up uh, Route 87 in Yonkers and look off to the right as you're going north, you'll see this. It's now a medical building for Montefiore. Um, and I think it's a rather classy building. It was extremely economical to build. Typical steel frame, concrete slabs on metal deck, composite steel beams and girders, steel interior columns, steel spandrel beams. But the major element here was, instead of a curtain wall, the facade of this building is made of quarter-inch thick steel plate, made by the steel fabricating shop, not by a curtain wall manufacturer. It's painted and simply fastened on. There were angles welded to the back of it and hung off the steel frame. Really inexpensive. Yes, it has to be painted, but curtain wall does need maintenance anyway. <clears throat> the use of this steel plate as a facade, of course, had some problems. We recognize that. Sometimes in a plate as thin as a quarter of an inch, you can see where the angles on the back are welded. Sometimes, sometimes there's this phenomenon called oil canning, where you get a little bit of waving in the surface. But we worked very hard to keep it straight and, uh, and looking good, and today it, it still does look good. I want to take a little bit of an aside for a minute and show you one feature of our early work because it has to do uh, with much of what I'm going to say after this. Um, what I'm talking about is the rehabilitation of tenement buildings that we did in the South Bronx, in Harlem, in Bedford-Stuyvesant. These were six-story apartment buildings with brick bearing walls and wood interior joists, timber floors, not much steel in these buildings. Um, the buildings that we worked on were vacant. They had reverted back to the ownership of New York City because the people who owned them didn't pay taxes on them. They were vacant. You can see what they looked like. There were no windows in them. Most of them had been burned out. Uh, they had been vandalized. Um, but then the federal government um, <coughs> instituted a program called Section 8, which was a rent supplement program. And the Department of Housing and Urban Development developed a program for low interest mortgages for properties like this. And all of a sudden, it became attractive to certain people to take these buildings and renovate them. And furthermore, the IRS allowed an accelerated depreciation write-off. So investors who knew nothing about real estate were willing to put their money into syndicates that gave them this accelerated write-off. That's something for the accountants among you to worry about. And I never understood how that worked. Um, at any rate, there was tremendous pressure on us to design the most economical solutions for these buildings because there wasn't a lot of money available for construction. We had to reuse as much of the existing as possible. Over the first 10 years of our practice, we renovated about 220 of these buildings, some 13,000 units of housing. That's a lot of buildings. Um, we see a lot of things in these buildings, um, and again, it was our education into working with older buildings. That's really important. After they're renovated, they look something like this. Now, you may not think that's gorgeous, uh, but it was amazing the transformation in these neighborhoods. The buildings often were not next to each other. They were often one or two spaces apart. And after we did the renovation, somebody would buy the in-between infill buildings and renovate them. Uh, you go into these neighborhoods today, and they are vibrant and vital and am I proud that we've worked on that. Um, we, we've transformed half of the South Bronx. So we did use an odd piece of steel here and there. But to be honest, the contractors tried to do everything with wood and masonry. Uh, once again, you know, in engineering school, we never learned about engineering of older buildings, of older materials, of the sensitivity of how one had to deal with things, uh, and how you did an examination and an evaluation of an older building. We learned this on the job. It made us not afraid of older buildings. 
Many of the established engineering firms in the city knew nothing about this type of building, and they didn't want to know. Uh, they were focused on traditional bread and butter work, new construction mostly like apartment houses, office buildings, shopping centers, etc. Um, we found that working on older buildings became an important part of our practice um, and represented a significant portion of our buildings and we actually got to like it. One day in the early 70s a call came in asking if we would participate in the modernization of the old manual elevators in Carnegie Hall. Um, at that time in the early 70s uh, Carnegie had lost its place as a major concert venue because Lincoln Center had just opened and Philharmonic Hall had drawn away all of the major orchestras, including the home of the New York Philharmonic. <clears throat> About 10 years before we got involved there, um, the building had been threatened with demolition and a skyscraper was planned for the site, the most awful looking building that was clad in red um, anodized aluminum. But at any rate, the famed violinist Isaac Stern um, spoke up at that time and he spearheaded a campaign to save the hall uh, from the wrecking ball. He convinced New York City to actually buy it, um, had it nominated as a National Historic Landmark so it couldn't be torn down, uh, and then got the city to put a few hundred thousand dollars into the absolute minimum of maintenance required and to clean it up a bit. Uh, the elevator renovation that we were called about um, it was almost comical if it wasn't so serious. These were water hydraulic piston operated elevators from 1891. And one day, one of the cylinders uh, came loose and the piston came out of it and it came plunging down the elevator shaft. It was lucky that it didn't go through the roof of one of the cabs and kill somebody. But they realized then that this system had had it. Uh, and of course the elevators eventually became uh, automated. I bring this up because it's the beginning of a long and happy relationship that we've had with Carnegie Hall, a, a relationship that endures to this day some 45 years later. After a few smaller projects there, our first major effort uh, was the implementation of the master plan that came to fruition in 1987. This program was developed by the Polshek Partnership, now called INEAD. Um, we performed a complete upgrade of the facade. We uh, <coughs> did a new entrance lobby, putting it at grade. None of you is old enough to remember when you went to Carnegie Hall and you opened the door and you had to immediately go up seven steps in order to get into the lobby. Not only was it ADA non-compliant, but it was difficult for anybody to get into that building. Um, and part of what we did was a complete facade restoration. Now, one of the f facts that we face with older buildings is uh, that we often don't have drawings of it. And Carnegie was a good example of that. We knew that 15 years before that, the drawings existed. The firm of Kahn and Jacobs had done some work there and they remembered having the drawings. They didn't know what they did with them. They disappeared, they weren't in their archives, and to this day, nobody has found them. The single drawing that exists from the original set is a section through. It's a beautiful drawing. Uh, it doesn't have much to do to help us as structural engineers, however. Um, we were forced in the areas that we were working to recreate the framing plans. In those years we made physical probes, we looked to see what there was there, we measured it, and we extrapolated into drawing a whole set of existing framing plans. That Carnegie Hall was one of our earliest steel buildings isn't surprising since it was built by Andrew Carnegie. And if you don't know that, he was the president and founder of the company that eventually became United States Steel, originally called Carnegie Steel. <clears throat> um, if you also um, know anything about Andrew Carnegie, um, he was a Scotsman. And a Scotsman doesn't like to spend money if he doesn't have to. And certain of the details of the construction were on the skimpy side, to say the least. This is a photograph of the eighth floor on the 56th Street side, the back side of Carnegie Hall. It's a little hard to understand this thing, but imagine that the window sill of the floor above, this sill, is actually quite crowned. It's much higher in the middle of each bay than it is at the ends, by as much as two inches. And there were a series of 10 bays marching down 58th Street. It looked, uh, 56th Street, it looked like the ocean. 
Every single bay had a hump in it. Well, we know they didn't build it this way, so it, it raised a flag for us, and one of the things we did was a probe at the eighth floor, uh, and it revealed that there were actually two beams in there side by side. This is a picture of the outer beam. It's got a chalk mark on it, and you can see a piece of it is cut. And you can also see that there's only one wide of brick um, on the outside of this beam pr protecting it. The tip of the flange was just four inches in from the exterior edge of the brick. It wasn't protected in any way. There was no flashing, no nothing, except the outer layer of brick. Well, um, over the course of 95 years, water had penetrated through the mortar joints and severely corroded the outer flanges. On the upper left, you can see a, a piece of the bottom flange that was cut out. The left part of it is the inside of the beam, which is in perfectly good shape. The right side is facing outward, and there's almost nothing left of the flange. Um, there's also a plan view of that, and you can see how it's just almost completely eaten away. Well, these are the things that we face in older buildings. What do you do? This is an operating building. There are people working in there. Um, it's very difficult to just simply say, you got to get out. So you, you figure out ways to get around it. Uh, here's a series of drawings um, of, of what happened. On the left-hand sketch, you see the two beams. The beam on the right is in perfectly good shape. It holds up the floor. The beam on the left, you can see the tip of the flange where it says corrosion, is only four inches in from the outside edge. So what we did was to cut out little strips of that, first of all, no, going underneath this all, and shore it up. Shore it down to the sill of the window below and make sure that the load <coughs> was carried somewhere else. Then we could cut pieces of the steel out that was defective and stick little pipe shores in so that that load would go through the pipe shore into the shoring and down to the floor below. That's the middle picture, the red pipe shore. And finally on the right, instead of repairing it with steel, we had all these pipes in that had to stay there, we threaded reinforcing bars around it and made a concrete beam out of that and were able to pour concrete in there and replace that corroded steel beam with a new concrete beam. We did this for 10 bays all along 56th Street, shoring each one as we went. Um, interesting solutions that you figure out as you're in the field and what needs to be done. <clears throat> the lesson to be learned here, always protect your spandrel beams. Uh, nowadays we teach that they should be flashed and we do put flashing over them uh, and we do protect them. Uh, here's the reason why. Two subsequent interventions at Carnegie Hall were uh, more dramatic than this. Uh, after the refurbishment in 1987, uh, the hall became, uh, once again, a, a huge draw for classical mu music. Uh, its famed acoustics were, were really sought after by uh, uh, performers all around the world. Um, so they finally had some resources there, and Isaac Stern convinced the board of trustees of Carnegie Hall um, that they needed an intermediate-sized performing space. The main hall of Carnegie seats about 2,800. The recital hall seats about 280. He wanted a hall of about 700 people, to seat 700 people. Where do you put it? There isn't any place to put it. The only place that could be to go down or to go up. Going up, it's a landmark. You can't do that. You, you can't change what the outside looks like. But you can go down, because it's not an interior landmark. So um, they planned a building uh, underneath, and you see on the left side there uh, sort of an exploded view of what was going to be put underneath Carnegie Hall um, with an auditorium that seated 700. The blue ring is the enclosing wall of the auditorium, um, and below is actual photograph of the finished hall called Zankel Hall, also done by the Polshek Partnership, uh, still called that then. Uh, this meant, by the way, carving out a space under Carnegie Hall, an operating concert hall that was giving concerts and that had uh, re rehearsals every day in it, um, and we had to remove 5,000 cubic yards of rock from underneath Carnegie Hall to make a space big enough. I don't know if you understand how much that is, but a truck, a dump truck that carries rock away maybe carries 20 cubic yards. So divide 5,000 by 20, it's a lot of trucks. 
I had the idea of, in off hours, using the subway tracks to haul the rock away. Um, the N and the R train is three feet away from Carnegie Hall. There's nothing but a brick wall between them. I thought we could make a portal, take the rock out there, it would be great. Well, the transit authority didn't like that idea very much, needless <laughs> to say. So the problem became not as much excavating the rock, not only excavating the rock, but actually getting it out. Now, on the left slide here, you can see a machine uh, excavating rock. It looked like a hard rock mine for almost two years. It was an incredible operation. Now, one of the things that we had to worry about was the acoustics of Carnegie Hall. And the music critics are very, very fussy. Um, in the original um, 1987 renovation, they detected a change. And in fact, somebody saw that they had poured concrete under the new stage and changed the acoustics. So here we were very careful not to tell anybody what we were doing. But in reality, we took out all of the columns underneath the auditorium and put in temporary shoring and replaced it eventually with permanent new columns. We tried to make the spacing roughly the same so that the natural frequency of the floor might behave similarly and the acoustics be similar. And we got away with it. The music critics didn't detect any changes uh, in the um, <clears throat> quality of the sound of the auditorium floor above. Um, the, <clears throat> the floor itself was very heavy as these terracotta arches uh, so that was in our favor. The floor of Zankel Hall actually is nine independent platforms that are on hydraulics, so they can change the configuration. It can be a flat floor, it can be a thr thrust stage like this, it can be in the round, uh, and it's very interesting, uh, the, the possibilities uh, that happen here. The most recent Carnegie Hall um, intervention opened a couple of years ago, and this was on the roof. Um, if you look at the left-hand slide, you can see down here a series of black hoods that were actually skylights that went down into studios on the eighth floor below. In the background here are what's called the Carnegie Towers. That was not part of what I'm going to describe, although we did work in there. <coughs> Carnegie decided that they would like to make this roof usable. Now, they can't build on top of it a permanent structure because it's a landmark, but if they made the roof surface usable, they could have an outdoor party venue or an event venue. Um, the problem here was, first of all, the skylights were in the way, and second of all, the roof and the roof trusses over the auditorium were not strong enough to support this kind of a thing. Um, makes work for engineers. Uh, indeed, this became another of our heroic efforts. Here's a picture of the trusses over the auditorium. Um, and you can see the four structural considerations here. The ceiling of the auditorium is suspended from these existing roof trusses. It's also very fragile. We had for years been looking at this ceiling. Uh, the suspension system is fragile. Pieces were always flaking off. We had to s say to the contractor, we're going to severely limit the vibration that we're going to allow in the ceiling. Can you still build it? And they said, yes, they could. Um, there wasn't enough room here to get a second mezzanine level in here, which we wanted to do. Uh, and also, we had to raise the roof in order to match the ninth, uh, I'm sorry, to, to, to get it to a level to match one of the interior floors where they'd have access for it. So the whole point here was we had to raise the, uh, the existing roof to get it level with the ninth floor. It, it wasn't as it was level as it was there. And then there was the added weight. It was going to be planting up there, paving up there, uh, public occupancy, live load. None of that would work. <clears throat> we decided to try to do as little intervention to the existing trusses as possible. We figured that it was extremely expensive to mess with them if we didn't have to. So the only major intervention is these two white diagonals at the ends, which did get reinforced with heavy plates. Otherwise, there was almost no intervention on the existing truss itself. We did install monitors in the ceiling, these orange things, so that if the vibration got to a certain level that we de deemed to be um, unacceptable, we had to stop construction. And this happened several different times. Um, 
What we did to reinforce it was not add, uh, was, was not to reinforce the existing, but to add a very heavy new top court, a special built up 36 inch steel girder that was connected to these new diagonals <coughs> so that the load spanned all the way across to the diagonals and came down and didn't place any more load on the existing interior members of the truss. So these in interior members were not affected by that gray line above. That load went right down the diagonals. We had to reinforce at each end here with grillages because the bearing uh, was e excessive on the brick, but we were able to do that too. In the process, we sneaked in a new mezzanine floor. The what? I don't know what that looks like. Okay. Uh, there was one uh, matching over here uh, and uh, in the existing tower, and we got to that. Uh, so we could walk into there. That's the new offices for Carnegie Hall. Um, so they were very excited about this um, intervention because they got more space and they got a, a roof garden. Um, and the finished product is really quite a dazzling uh, sight. And this is actually a rendering, but this is the real thing over here. <clears throat> the original with these black hooded skylights and we're now, we have one major skylight left uh, and, and all the rest is, is uh, occupiable space. There are actually a few skylights along the edge there too. So if you get invited to a party on the roof of Carnegie, go. It's, it's really a, a great space. It's a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> now, without sounding like a spokesman for the Steel Institute, uh, I want to tell you that this example of performing a complicated intervention on a major historical building is possible really only because it's made out of steel. Um, I have nothing against concrete as a material. I love concrete. I love to work with it. Um, but it's much more difficult to perform major alterations on concrete structures once they're built. Um, steel can be readily shored, cut, reinforced, welded. Um, it's a joy to work with. Concrete can be a nightmare. So, bringing back to life what seemed to me to be a pile of dirty bricks in 1971, uh, it's turned out to be a major achievement for our firm, and we're very proud of our work there. Heroic? I'm not sure. Certain parts of it might be, but a lot of it was just plain hard work. Digging into the details, finding out what was there, what was there finding out um, the existing framing so we could recreate framing plans, um, making sure that we could transform our wishes into workable details. A lot of hard work. People don't realize what goes into that. Well, on to some, something very different. In 1981, I think it was, or 82, I got a call from England from Ove Arup and Partners in London. Now, I had worked for Arabs in London in 1963 and 1964, when it was not a huge international firm, it was a large firm, but mostly in England. Uh, and I had a lot of contacts still there, people that I had remained friendly with. And it was now that they were becoming the associates in the management part of the firm. And one of their, well, not one of, their, their most famous engineer and maybe the best structural engineer of the last quarter of the 20th century was Peter Rice. <clears throat> and Peter and I actually were quite friendly. Peter was my landlord. <laughs> I rented an apartment from him when I lived in in London. Um, the, the call concerned this building that you, you see up here. It was in Princeton, New Jersey um, for a British firm called, uh, and it was to be called the PATS Center, P-A-T-S Center, and they did research, industrial research. They had clients like Volvo and uh, electronics clients and pharmaceutical clients, and they needed flexible space. Um, <clears throat> the architect for this building was Richard Rogers. And he had been catapulted into fame about five years earlier when he and his fellow teammate, Renzo Piano, won the competition for the Pompidou Center in Paris. Many of you have been in that building, and certainly all of you know the building. Uh, it was a remarkable piece of exoskeletal work, and this maybe looks tame com compared to it, but you can see some of the um, genesis of where this building came from in looking at uh, what, what Pompidou was. Um, Arup asked if we would collaborate with them. It was a very flattering offer indeed, and uh, of course we accepted. Um, Richard Rogers was very much into his phase of building things out of what he called a kit 
of parts. And here's a drawing he made of the various parts of this building. And there really weren't that many of them. They were repeated in bays. I think there were nine frames of this sort that gave 75 foot clear spans on each side of a central core. He was also fascinated with exoskeletal structures. And so the combination of the two uh, yielded this. Now, you know, at this time, the British engineers were very much into uh, suspension structures and cable state structures. The Humber Bridge, the Severn Bridge, uh, they had just built the Bosporus Bridge, the, the bridge across uh, the span in Turkey. So uh, suspension structures were a big thing for them. Here's some pictures of the construction <coughs> of how it went up. Um, you can see the repeated frames here. Um, you can see the, the basic element here uh, of just the plain structure. Um, it was a very simple building, really. And the idea was to have this complete flexibility in a column-free environment. We spent a great deal of time simplifying the details um, and refining these elements of the kit of parts until what, the components really became quite simple. <coughs> the erection scheme also became fairly obvious. We did a, a lot of investigation with the local steel shops to make sure that there wouldn't be a scare factor in their pricing. And they looked at it, and when we talked them through it, they said, yeah, yeah, that's not going to be so hard. And they were true to their word. <clears throat> in the end, we got really good bids from them. This building in 1984, when it was finished, was built for $105 a square foot. Even in those years, that was a good price. Uh, everybody was very happy with um, what they got. So um, the inside of it, of course, became uh, a very busy thing. One thing to look at here is the coating system. Uh, it was painted, everything was painted in a shop and it was brought out wrapped and erected with the wrapping on it and then they took the paper off like a Christmas present uh, and you had a finished painted structure. To do the painting that we needed in the field would have been extremely difficult. So doing it in the shop, um, I think allowed for uh, a much longer and more durable quality of paint. Now, again, switching gears. Oh, all right. I like this one in the flowers. Here you can also see the mechanical units up on the top of the roof and the big round ducts that are the silver ducts that are <coughs> there. So not only the structure, but all the mechanical shows here as well. And again, you can see how simple it is. These rings or donuts of steel plate and everything was done with clevises, most of them standard clevises and bolts. Um, not anything difficult. One of the interesting concepts here was what makes the masts uh, stable out of plane. And they're much like a ship's mast. They have small guys on them to come out and then come back to the base. Um, I have to give Peter Rice credit for that. Uh, it was a very elegant detail and Peter insisted on having that and we were happy to do that. But shifting gears, back to something historical. You may <coughs> recognize this, although you don't usually see it from the air, but it's Ellis Island. And um, the building on the left with the red roof is the Museum of Immigration. Unfortunately, it got flooded badly with Superstorm Hurricane Sandy, but it's back in operation now. Um, we were really privileged to get a call from Bayer Blinder Bell, the architects, and along with the Boston firm of Feingold Alexander in 1984 to work on what would become the largest historic preservation project in the United States. At the time, it was valued just under $200 million. Originally, this was an immigration station constructed in 1896, and you can see a number of support buildings here. Uh, to the right side is a baggage and dormitory building. Uh, to the left, you can see a little bit of a link to the south half of the island, which was not part of this project. That's where the hospital um, ward buildings were. People uh, were quarantined there if they came in with measles. Um, the main building was to be adaptively reused as a museum of immigration. And to do this, a lot of changes had to be made. Um, the open interior light courts were roofed over and they were made circulation corridors. That's where the escalators were put in. Uh, all the new mechanical had to be put in, new shafts, new supports. Um, this is the main registry room, uh, <clears throat> which has a steel frame roof above this ceiling, which is Guastavino tile. You may know what that is. Uh, much of New York City is built like this. Um, hundreds of buildings are. And each of these tiles had to be sounded to make sure that it wasn't loose because the building had been open to the weather 
and we worried about tiles falling on somebody. They're only stuck in place with mortar, albeit a super mortar. Uh, we sounded every single of the 19,000 tiles and found about 25 that were loose that had to be reconnected. Um, all this was kind of grunt work, um, but it contributed to what we think was a rather glorious final accomplishment. There was one significant structural steel piece here, and that was the entrance canopy. Originally there was a entrance canopy here when the immigrants came in off of a boat. They came in underneath a glass roofed metal framed canopy that was very highly articulated, riveted together with sort of scroll work brackets that supported everything. Uh, it had been demolished many years uh, before, uh, largely because it was badly corroded. Um, in designing a new one, I must say that as engineers we like to participate in the design, and I got very involved in this, uh, and fought very hard for the principles of preservation that say, when you replace a missing element, um, you don't usually try to replicate it. That's not considered good form by the preservation community. You put something back that you know wasn't there originally. It could recall what was there originally, but it didn't replicate it. So I argued for a modern tubular kind of canopy that was made of all welded steel, very smooth, very fluid. Um, <clears throat> and I also said we should make it out of stainless steel. And I wanted to shot peen the finish. Um, I don't know if you know what shot peening is, but it, it, it's a distressed kind of finish, so it isn't so glossy and shiny. Uh, but it's a beautiful finish. Um, our firm even went to the expense of taking a piece of this material and having it shot teamed at our own expense and bringing it to the client and saying, look, isn't this wonderful? And they said, yes, it's wonderful, but it's also too expensive. So we didn't win that battle, but we did win the battle of the, the form. And it is a welded shape that's it's painted carbon steel and it will need some maintenance. Uh, it's roughly the same size and pretty much the same configuration as the original. Uh, but I have to say um, that it is clearly a different looking animal. I'm going to have to start to move a little faster. Um, I want to show you a genre of buildings that uh, has become our largest practice sector, and that is higher education, college and university buildings. Even here at Cooper, we've worked in the foundation building across the street. If you go in to the Great Hall and you look up on the arches, you may see crack monitors up there. Uh, if you wonder what they are, well, we stuck them there because we're interested to know whether these cracks that are in the arches are moving. Don't ask me who reads them and when, but <laughs> they're, su they're supposed to be, okay. <clears throat> um, here's a picture at Cornell of the second oldest building on the campus called Sage Hall, um, which had outgrown its usefulness. It did not meet the building code. The floors were wood. They were of different levels. They didn't meet ADA requirements. Um, the roof had a um, a big hole in it where there was a, a light well in it there. Uh, and it was decided that they would keep the form of the building uh, and gut the entire thing. I mean gut everything. Nothing was left in, inside of it. And sh we shored the walls on the exterior because they wouldn't hold themselves up <coughs> if you took out all of the inside and inserted a completely new steel frame inside of it. Here you can see it under construction. Uh, some of the steel work down here. And you can see where the old light well was is now a skylight. Uh, this has become one of the great campus centers for meeting people. Um, students love it. Uh, it's a light, bright space. It happens to be very centrally located on campus. It's the business school now, the Johnson School of Management, uh, but everybody uses it. And there's a cafeteria here, and it's always crowded and lots of fun. Um, again, an intervention here uh, is it heroic? Not really. It was, it was kind of standard steel framing. We designed some sort of a shoring system to hold up the walls. Um, but every little detail contributed to what was a very successful building. The steel frame skylight was pretty carefully thought out. Um, and it's a big skylight. And as you know or may not know, skylights are pretty expensive. Uh, this one was done, I think, on a pretty good budget. Um, I'm going to run through some fast ones. I don't know if any of you have been to Columbia, uh, but when they had their new computer science department in the 1980s, um, <clears throat> it wasn't a big department, but they wanted a separate space, and they wanted it to be central and near engineering. So we figured out a way to put it on top of the engineering building, the mud building, 
uh, that's not what you see on the right. On the right is the Fairchild building. But this sits on top of a building uh, that was never meant to hold another floor. We get asked this question very often. Can I add a floor to a building when there was never a provision for it? And I know a bunch of people from our office are here in the audience, and I think every one of them has done a calculation to try to prove can we squeeze enough load capacity out of an existing building to add something very lightweight. This is an extremely lightweight one-story addition um, that sits on top of the mud building at Columbia and houses computer science. <clears throat> in Ithaca, a brand new building for Ithaca College, one of the first lead gold buildings. This is the business school. Robert Stern did this. I didn't mention the architect for computer science. It was Clement and Halsband. I have to give credit where it's due. You're seeing these finished buildings, the finished form. Um, I feel guilty about taking any credit for them. Um, or if it's blameworthy because you don't like it, then don't blame me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> these are architectural um, um, features. You know, we have a lot to do with them sometimes, but the final aesthetic decisions clearly are not always ours. Uh, when one is working on a sustainable project, again, structural engineers may be thought not to have much input, not nearly as much certainly as the mechanical engineers do, and that's true, but we have some, and we're very proud of our work in sustainability. We were one of the first firms involved with it, and we still are very involved, and here was an early example of it. <clears throat> Up at Columbia, at Baker Field, Stephen Hall did this Campbell Sports Center, uh, which is a really interesting looking thing. Um, and just from first looks, you, you say, well, is this heroic? I don't know. But when you look at some of the details or, which are exposed, uh, it was very, very carefully detailed and designed. And in the right-hand slide, you can see where they actually cut a piece of the wall out so you could see the steel connections. I mean, that's amazing. Usually we want to hide them. So it was uh, very carefully designed, as you can see, all the bolts in a row. Uh, and it, yes, typical steel, but no, uh, we didn't leave it to the shop to decide how to do the bolting pattern. That was all part of the requirement uh, and the design. Uh, back up at Cornell, you heard not to say that I was a Cornell graduate, so we've done, I think, 11 buildings up there. One likes to go back to one's own campus. Um, this is the most recent one up there. It's the back of the uh, College of Arts and Sciences, Goldwyn Smith Hall, by Coder Kim, Boston Architects, um, and it's called Clarman Hall. It fills in a C, sh the, the back of a C-shaped building, um, one of the oldest buildings on campus with a very modern intervention, bowstring trusses. Uh, you can see the top curve of the truss there. I didn't have a really good uh, interior photo, so I did the, use the rendering, but it does look like this, in fact. Um, and inside of this um, glass atrium are two tower buildings that house off faculty offices and some classrooms. Underneath are big lecture halls, and again, this has become uh, an atrium cafeteria, which is a great meeting place for students, and they all love it. The new law school at Penn State by NEAD Architects, a lovely, clean, crisp building. I think it won some local awards. Uh, would you say this is heroic? From a, an engineering point of view, probably not. Uh, but I think Penn State is very proud of this, and they should be. They've got a lovely building here, and done economically, and we're very proud to work on things like this. Uh, and to say that, well, it's not the same as um, some other famous one that won all big national awards, so what? This is a great building, one that we, you know, we learned a lot from, uh, and we're, as I say, we do these by the hundreds, and we're very proud of it. Uh, and the last education building I want to show you is probably a little more heroic. This is the architecture school at Cornell, uh, which finally got built after three failed attempts at a competition. Uh, and the final design is by Rem Koolhaas, um, OMA, the Office of Metropolitan Architecture. Um, it's got a story. You can see this thing is cantilevered out over a street. It was meant to have columns on the left side, not to be cantilevered. And we designed it with the columns and showed it to the city traffic engineer. And he said, sorry, those columns are too close to the road. 
Now there's this little building on the left side of that, and immediately behind that little building is one of the great geologic features of the Cornell campus, Fall Creek Gorge. You may know the deep gorges on the two sides of the Cornell campus. <coughs> Not much room there. We couldn't push the columns any further to the left or the north. So I said, well, we can push them to the right. We could realign the road a little bit and we'll take a few feet out of the building because we want to get the columns there. And the city engineer said, nope, we're not going to let you realign the road. Well, we get stuck with something like that. You can't put a column in, you can't move the road. What do you do? You can't deliver the building. Now that's somewhat heroic. I wish it hadn't been because it cost the university some $3 million, but they made something out of it. We worked very closely with REM's office to get the configuration of these trusses, which are neither fish, fowl, nor herring. They're not traditional Pratt trusses. They're not traditional uh, in trusses with, made out of triangles. They're not virendils with straight members. They're sort of something in between. <clears throat> and you should see the number of iterations we did in order to achieve this. They were not necessarily just random uh, investigations. A lot of it had to do with the inside. How did the studio inside function? This is where the main design studios are. They actually laid out the furniture and made sure where the circulation paths were going to be and that they wouldn't be trust members there. So uh, it's an extremely successful uh, solution to a problem. Uh, I was very skeptical of it in the beginning. Uh, it's worked out very well and they're very happy with it. Again, you can see here the roadway and this quote, unnecessary cantilever but it's there. <coughs> so, in looking at this array of higher ed buildings, I think we can say some are heroic, some modestly so, um, but the bulk are probably within the realm of the pure modest. Um, I wouldn't use the word ordinary, because for both the creator of these buildings and the user of the buildings, there's always something special about them. The last category of buildings I want to show you is museums. Um, there's been a spate of new museum construction at these institutions um, because they've had to compete with audiences. And they've also found that their spaces do not suit the current way that they would like to exhibit their, their, their wares, their work. So they want new buildings. And we've done a great deal of work for the Smithsonian, uh, both here in New York at Cooper Hewitt and the Downtown Museum of the American Indian New York branch at Bowling Green. Um, but the and we're also doing work on the, on the mall at the, at the castle. But the, the newest building that we've done for Smithsonian, of course, is the great uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, <clears throat> we did this in collaboration with Guy Nordenson's office here in New York. And the architects were a foursome. Uh, David Adjay was the chief designer. Freelon Associates from, from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, Charlotte, I guess they are. Um, Davis Brody Bond from New York. and. The Smith Group from Washington were all participants in this job, and it just opened last September, and it is really quite spectacular. If you do want to visit it, let me tell you, you've got to get online and get tickets in advance, about three months. Um, but it's really wonderful. What you see here is an anodized aluminum um, bronze-colored screen wall that is called the Corona, and it's hung off of a major steel frame um, that has big trusses that can support the weight of this. And this was extremely delicate in its design, and not only designed for strength, but for movement. And we had to make sure these things were very stiff uh, so that these elements could be hung and aligned and they wouldn't go out of alignment. So it, it's, it's very uh, interesting that you design for serviceability as well as strength when you do these architectural buildings. I want to show you two quick ones uh, in New York, both by Ennead. This is a little tiny addition to the back of the Museum of the City of New York up on Fifth Avenue and 104th Street, maybe, something like that. Um, and in itself, very nice little building, uh, but what it did for the museum, when you go on the other side, the front door, is extraordinary. It transformed the whole, the whole building. This little, I think it was 3,000 square feet or something like that, maybe a little more. Uh, <clears throat> um, and it's amazing what one little addition can do for a building. Very simple structure here. Steel frame, it's got its own foundation, it's not built on top of anything else. Um, nothing heroic about this, and yet what it did in the transformation was extraordinary. <coughs> it's 
something a little bit more heroic, the Brooklyn Museum on Eastern Parkway. On the left, it's the McKinmead and White building. Um, and he had again did this. On the left, the original building had a, a monumental staircase, much like the Metropolitan Museum does on Fifth Avenue. On the right, you can see it's been removed. It was removed in 1934 to gain better and easier access for the public. Uh, look what got lost. I mean, it looks kind of ridiculous, kind of propped up like that. And you go in at, the at that lower level, uh, and it's a very low ceiling, uh, very uninviting entrance. So the museum, in its uh, major master plan, which has been ongoing since the 1970s, uh, Irata Asazaki uh, was part of that with Polshek. Um, they decided to try to do something about the front entrance. <coughs> and the transformation is indeed an enormous one. A very modern curved glass and steel entry has been put on there. Uh, from the inside you can see these stainless steel fins with glass above and very light trusses made out of cable and strut holding it all together. Um, <coughs> You can go in now, and once you're in there, you can go up steps and go and enter in at the main level, what was the original main level, or you can go in at the ground if you're uh, a disabled person. So it, an, an extraordinary uh, transformation with a very modern entry canopy uh, to an 1890s a traditional classical Beaux-Arts McKim Eden White building. And now finally, um, the last three I'm going to show you are works by Renzo Piano. Um, we've been very fortunate to work with Renzo uh, on most of his East Coast work for the last number of years. This is the Morgan Library, now called the Morgan Library and the Museum. There were three buildings existing on the site, and um, <coughs> when Morgan decided to try to make a real effort to become a more public uh, institution, have a more public face, because people always thought it was a private library, even if it wasn't. Uh, they wanted to make it more inviting, and they uh, asked Renzo to do a design that knitted together the three buildings. Immediately, you can see two of them. On the left is the old Morgan Mansion from the 1850s. The Morgans didn't buy it till the 1880s when they renovated it. To the right is a building called the Annex, which is a pure art museum done by J.P. Morgan's son. And what you don't see is behind that on the right, the original J.P. Morgan 1906 um, museum, which is the most luxurious thing you've ever seen. Uh, just a glorious piece of uh, ornate architecture. The challenge of knitting these three together was extraordinary and getting space in doing it. A rare book vault, 60 feet down into the rock below the grade. Um, my first question was, what happens when a water main breaks and the water comes rushing in and floods the, the, the vault? And they said, well, design against that. So we designed submarine doors that could take a 60-foot head of water, and we designed a completely waterproof structure that the books are housed in. Um, all other kinds of things as well, but the highlight of this is what Renzo calls the piazza. It's a cube, 50 feet by 50 feet by 50 feet <coughs> in the back that knits all three buildings together. It's all glass, which is one of his trademarks, a glass roof. Um, in its way, very simple, but boy, did it take a lot to get there. Worrying about things like the hierarchy of a system. What's primary? What's secondary? What's tertiary? Um, does it make sense? Can you read it? In the beginning, the answer to, to me was no. And I had quite a discussion with Renzo about um, being unhappy with the fact that the structure wasn't logical. And when he asked me why, I expressed it. And I said, I don't think you can read this and this and this. And he said, OK, what would you do about it? <laughs> and then he had me stumped. Um, but together, we worked one afternoon for three hours. If you go to their Paris office on Roudet's Archives, right near the Pompidou Center, they have a model shop on the ground floor with seven model makers going. And Renzo called one of them. And as we came up with new designs, he would call down. And the model maker would come up with a new little system of the the organization of the glass roof and the framing members. Um, and it was made in 20 minutes, maybe. And the model had the beams completely to scale, including flanges uh, on them. And uh, it, it, just an amazing uh, technology. This is the days before 3D printers, of course. Um, anyway, I think we came up with a system that was 
not only logical, but very handsome. The second Renzo Piano building was in Cambridge at Harvard, <clears throat> the Harvard Art Museums. Many of you may know this building originally as the Fogg Museum. Uh, it now houses not only the Fogg collection, but two more collections, the Sackler and the Reisinger. So it's now called Hams, the Harvard Art Museums. And the original building is the red brick that you can see, um, starting here and going forward. <clears throat> That's Quincy Street in the front where the, and the, uh, um, the GSD is just up the block from that. 1928 building, kind of colonial style, that had been added onto, agglomerated onto, glommed onto, uh, with about six or seven additions on the back <clears throat> as they needed a space here and a space there. And it was pretty awful. The inside was rather dirty and rather dingy. The holdings of this museum are extraordinary. 275,000 pieces of art. That's more than the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston has. So they can exhibit only a little bit of it, and what they did, did exhibit wasn't uh, light and bright and cheerful and clean. Um, the central arcade, uh, uh, central, I shouldn't say arcade, the central uh, atrium of the building uh, had a traditional skylight with a lay light, and the lay light was always dirty. There was always things laying on it and um, unpleasant. So uh, they did a major uh, renovation of this, took everything off the back of the building, including the back of the building itself, all the additions in the back, and added on, uh, as you can see, this light-colored wing in the back, um, and, and came up with really quite an extraordinary piece of work. The, the glass atrium um, goes up to the roof, which you can see. You can see the great smoke exhaust fans, which they've made a feature of this. In an atrium of this size, they needed that. And down at the very bottom, you can see a row of arches. These are um, travertine stone uh, from Italy. They're a recreation of, a, uh, of an Italian palazzo made into kind of a cloister shape. Um, and it's really now an extraordinarily light and bright museum. One thing I would mention is the new addition um, has big clear span galleries so they can exhibit things better. But the floor to floor height was terribly limited because it had to match the existing building, which originally was not air conditioned, of course. Now the new building has to be air conditioned, both the old part and the new. Uh, so everything is squeezed down into an 11 and a half foot floor to floor height. So the new beams uh, for the long span galleries are very shallow and they're full of holes through which the ductwork penetrates. So this is another challenge that we have in working with older buildings. You just don't have unlimited freedom. You sometimes have to match things um, and the challenges are, are very serious. Is this being heroic? No, I wouldn't say it's being heroic. Is it tough to do? Yeah, it is. Do we get credit for it? Yeah. People assume we know how to do it. Um, but it's very challenging, um, and, um, we, but we're used to it by now. And lastly, the, the Whitney. Um, Whitney Museum for American Art, uh, as you know, opened, I guess, a year and a half ago now. Um, and <clears throat> it's on the west side in the Gainesville area, right on the Hudson River. And <clears throat> the challenge for the Whitney originally was they were in the Marcel Breuer building on Madison and 75th and they ran out of space. They owned the site next door. They went through iteration after iteration to figure out how to build a new building there and connect it to the Breuer building, and they ran into nothing but opposition from their neighbors, and they finally packed it in, and as you know, they've sold that building now to the Metropolitan Museum, and they've moved everything into one building downtown at Gainsford Street. They were worried about that move in terms of neighborhood, and would people come, and they've been rewarded. Yes, people come. This is a very interesting building, I think, because people look at it and they say, eh, what's so hot about this building? Um, I think it's a great example of Renzo's work showing him not trying to push the architect's ego out in front of everything. He answered the client's program here, really, to a T. This building has the largest clear span galleries in New York. Um, they had a tough budget. and. Uh, lots of other things that they needed to meet and Renzo listened every step of the way and gave them what they needed and it really gave them quite something wonderful. This is looking at it from the other side. Uh, you can see in the foreground the end of the High Line. This is where the High Line begins on Gainsford Street. Uh, I must say the High Line is another one of our firm's projects that we're very proud of. So it's nice to stand here and see two in one shot. 
Um, the, the building has a lot of structural manipulation in it um, to try to make it economical. Uh, the seismic design of this building was really pushed to something fairly new uh, and extreme, uh, and our engineers did a bang up job on that. Nobody realizes how much they did and how much money they saved the, the client in doing that. Um, here you can see some of the uh, nice features up on the uh, sixth and seventh and eighth floors, outdoor sculpture gallery, uh, which are great fun, these galleries, uh, on a nice day. And they look down at the High Line. Uh, here are these galleries. And you look over the Hudson River the other way. <clears throat> it's really an absolutely lovely space. Um, this was Renzo Piano in collaboration with um, Cooper Robertson from New York. Um, really a, a, an absolutely um, great solution, I think, to the needs of the Whitney. All right. So I think in, in all these projects, I must say, we've used the latest technologies. Our analytic abilities uh, have increased enormously from my early days when all I had to work with was a slide roll. You know what that is? At least you've heard of it. You may have never seen one. Um, you know, with a slide rule, we could do a certain amount accurately, predict a certain amount of stress. But after that, I don't want to use the word guesswork. We use a technique called uh, approximate analysis. And depending on how good you were at that was how close you came to the right answer. Uh, mostly that told us what kind of um, strength we needed in the building. Almost never were we able to predict movements. The beauty of our analytic capabilities now using the computer is we not only know stresses, but we know movement. And I think that's really a terrific um, improvement for us. Um, do we hope for newer advances in steel? You bet. Uh, what are some of the things that, that I would like to see? Well, I'd like to see certainly new advances in, in fire engineering. Um, can the basic molecular structure of iron and steel be changed so that it can resist the high temperatures of a fire in a building without losing strength. Why not? Why not figure out a way to, to change it? Maybe it's not called iron and steel anymore, but whatever it is. Uh, we'll change the name of the institute, guys. How's that? Okay. <coughs> um, how could we make a steel inexpensively that doesn't corrode. Now, we know how to make stainless steel, but most people say, I can't afford that. Well, how can we make something that's affordable? I never want to paint a piece of steel again. I never want to repair a rusty piece of steel again. Challenge, make some steel that doesn't rust and make it affordable. We can do that. Maybe it's by alloying, maybe it's some new crystal structure of the steel, but whatever, we can do that. We've been able to make high strength steel quite well and affordable. One thing we haven't been able to do is make a steel with a higher modulus of elasticity. That is a property that makes it stiffer so that it doesn't bend as much, it doesn't compress as much, it doesn't stretch as much. Why not? Why can't we make a steel with a better E? Can you do that, guys? Next week? <laughs> All right. Um, if we could do all these things, wow, we'd really have something. These are just a few things on my wish list. Any of you out there that want to get rich quick, just pick one of these. And if you can be successful at it, you know, we'll come and worship at your feet. So where, where does all of this get us? Um, of course, I've really shown a disproportionate number of heroic structures after I went ahead and said maybe only 250 out of 21,000 are really heroic. Uh, but they're more fun to look at in many ways. Let's go back to reality. These are really infrequent, these heroic structures. Um, our everyday work, though, is every bit as important, and in many ways, every bit as gratifying as these heroic buildings. Um, the, as I said, these jobs provide tremendous training for our younger engineers and learning opportunities. Um, ability to apply cutting edge techniques even in more modest buildings that we sometimes transfer uh, uh, the application of to our more heroic. Um, and I'm constantly amazed as I walk around our office and I do reviews of projects about the great care that every one of our staff 
lavishes on every project. I often wonder how we make any money. Um, but somehow we're still here and flourishing. So I guess it works. Um, those of you from our office here, keep up the good work. Um, so I showed you some examples of new building construction, of additions and alterations, renovations, historic preservation work. Um, one informs the other. We learn from old buildings not to make the mistakes again. We saw at Carnegie Hall, no flashing on a steel beam, look what happened. We don't make those mistakes anymore, I hope. Um, <clears throat> in new building technology, we use materials or techniques or analytic methods uh, that are completely applicable sometimes to historic buildings. So there is this tremendous uh, interplay and, um, and switch over. One of our problems with so many buildings is that how do we make sure that everybody in the office knows what's going on? Um, we have an internal database, something we call the Silman Source, in which we are attempting, um, and have done a pretty good job, I think, of, of keeping a good record of what's been done uh, that's interesting. Uh, we call the input of this writing a techie, not a wiki, but a techie. Uh, and we have these um, technical briefs about what was done where. Uh, and it's a resource for all of our engineers. And we've assigned uh, one of our senior associates to be in charge of this. We think it's that important. I hope that you've learned that um, diversity in a practice can be a very worthwhile asset. How not every building has to be heroic to be meaningful. How the old informs the new, how the new informs the old, um, and how we have lots of room in the steel industry for new things to happen. I have to show you one more slide. The end. <laughs> Their way of saying the end. I thank you very much. <laughs>